making event not only for St. Luke's, uh, in, but also for the Philippines as well, to host the first of this such meeting in, in our country and in our hospital. And my thanks also goes out to uh, Hai Chong Ching Hai Fu, who managed to put everything together uh, with, the, with the expert uh, organization of uh, Ms. Sarah Hu, who has been helping us uh, with, with our uh, HIFU installation and uh, the, the conduct of treatments of, of HIFU in the country. We saw the technology of HIFU uh, maybe two or three years ago during the pandemic. Uh, and we outright believed in that technology. It did take a while for us to, for the Philippines and for St. Luke's to get the first HIFU machine. Uh, but finally, we opened our doors uh, February of 2023 uh, to, to start the initial HIFU treatments in the country. And I can tell everyone in the audience and also those who are online that that, that, that technology did not fail us. And I think it is something that is really uh, going to be a standard of care, uh, not only breaking new ground for minimally invasive treatment for uterine fibroids and, and myoma, uh, but it's going to be groundbreaking and it's going to be trend-setting uh, for minimally invasive therapy. And that is what we want. That is what we endeavor to give the best care, the most comfortable care, and the most minimally invasive care to our patients. So you have a couple of days of intensive talks and, and workshops, and I welcome everyone uh, who are here to, to our hospital. Our doors are open for you. Our facilities are open for you. And I also welcome everyone online to join us in this uh, intensive learning uh, activity for the next two days. Again, thank you very much, everybody. So thank you, Dr. Serrano. So may you now call on um, Professor, the President of the International Society of Minimally Invasive and Virtual Surgery, Professor Philip De Camp, to give his opening remarks. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mr. President. Very nice introduction. So, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, it's really a privilege for me to be here today. As you know, I was a FIGO, uh, past FIGO vice president. I'm currently the president of this society. And I'm, of course, very happy to be here today. It's a privilege for me. It's my first time in Philippines, so it's all, also a great, great time for me. Um, you know, um, this, this meeting is very important. We have a very exciting program, outstanding speakers, as, we, as you've seen on the paper. They are all experts in their fields, and they will present uh, diverse topics from the fair amount of change in practice with salivary test in endometriosis, which will be my lecture, the next one, the first one of the morning. And this is the aim is to reduce surgery. Then to robotic surgery, high full for adenomyosis and, and uh, fibroids with or without infertility, vulvar and cervical diseases, liver cancer, plus learning curve and state of the art for high full. So you see it will be a full day, fantastic topics and uh, exciting speakers. You have to know that the HIFU uh, focused ultrasound tumor therapeutic system is now available to patients in more than 32 countries and regions, and it has treated more than 280,000 patients with various benign and malignant tumors, as well as more than 1 million non-tumor disease around the world. So, you know, it's not an ongoing technology, it's a recognized technology, and it's an amazing change for patients. We all know, I, I'm a gynecologist, as you may know, so we're skipping from urology to gynecology, but the uterus is the cradle of life and the promotion of minimally invasive and non-invasive technologies for the preservation of the organ integrity and function is paramount. So in this spirit, I welcome you to this event aimed at uplifting the well-being of patients suffering from endometriosis, uterine fibroids, adenomyosis, and cancers. May this be a time of learning and growth for us all. Enjoy the meeting. Thank you so much.
Thank you. So thank you, Professor. Uh, we will now start uh, our regional conference, the strategies and advancements in minimally invasive and non-invasive surgery. So for our first session, the development of minimally invasive and non-invasive surgeries, may we now call on our session chair and uh, moderator, Dr. Marie Cruz Javier. Um, she is the Vice Chair for Administration at the Department of OBGYN and the Section Head of the Minimally Invasive Gynecologic and Robotic Surgery <clears throat> here at the St. Luke's Medical Center, Global City. Dr. Marie. Thank you, Dr. Severino, for the introduction and good morning to everyone. So it's um, an honor for me, again, to, um, to welcome the President of, of ISMIDS, um, Dr. Philip Descamp, um, I don't think I, he needs further introduction. Um, as we all know, he's the head of the ISMIBS and a FIGO vice president and the president of um, CNGOF, which is um, the Society for French College of OBGYN and the vice president of um, SCGP, which is the Society of Gynecologists in France. I cannot pronounce the, the the what the acronym stands for. So let me welcome back on stage Dr. Philippe de Camp, who will lecture on the this innovative approach in um diagnosing pelvic endometriosis. His topic is entitled Will M microRNA salivary diagnostic test reduce the number of laparoscopies for peritoneal endometriosis. Let us all welcome back Dr. Descamp on the stage. Thank you. And then here. Thank you. Okay, so back. Um, so um, I will bring you in a journey of uh, uh, the future of medicine and uh, most, most of my activity is endometriosis surgery. Um, but I've been working on a very exciting new project about the salivary diagnostic test. So I'm going to try to explain to you in 20 minutes what we did and where we are heading. So uh, everybody here knows that endometriosis is a nightmare for women. It's 10% of women in their reproductive age. And uh, we know that it's uh, causing pain and infertility. And there are three subtypes, peritoneal, deep infiltrating endometriosis, and endometrioma. So the main problem with endometriosis, apart from surgery, which is difficult surgery, but the main problem is the delayed diagnosis. And as you know, in the world literature, it takes seven to 10 years in average to reach the diagnosis. So it's a big, big issue. And 40% of the women will see five to 10 doctors consultations with MRI, with ultrasound, waiting for the results, trying a new treatment and blah, blah. And 25% of all patients will have laparoscopy. So uh, there's, there was a very interesting uh, paper published in 2022 in the New England Journal of Medicine trying to explain this. And as you see in this small video, what, what, the more you're waiting, the more uh, severe is the disease with those deep infiltrating endometriosis that we all know and that we are treating every day. So the last international recommendations were issued in 2022. There were the HRA guidelines, and uh, we, we started publishing in 2022. So of course, our uh, tool is not in, in, in doesn't figure in those guidelines. So what is written is there's no um, uh, you, the clinicians uh, are recommended to use MRI and ultrasound. But if it's negative, it doesn't mean you don't have a peritoneal disease. And this is the main issue. Of course, if you've got a big cyst, if you've got a big, deep infiltrating node, there's no, no problem. With Reporting in progress. Doctors, which were specialized in NGS, new generation sequencing, and artificial intelligence. And those guys were not two young guys in a garage with a computer. They were already a company, you know, working for big companies like Michelin, the tires, like Sanofi for research. So they were, uh, they had a recognition in this world. So we were a team of three centers in France and we started working with them and they were interested by endometriosis, understanding that it was in a very important health issue. So we started 
understanding and talking about the microRNAs. Of course, I'm, I'm a surgeon, I'm not a biologist, and it was a new field for me, for us. And we started working on this. And from what I understood is the microRNAs are used for translation between the messenger RNA and the protein. Remember the story of the messenger RNA and the vaccine COVID. Remember that the vaccine COVID was elaborated within less than two months, 60 uh, less than 60 days, and it saved life, millions of lives around the globe because of NGS and because of artificial intelligence. Otherwise, it would have taken many years. And so we started being interested by those microRNAs. And you see that you have several families, to be clear, to be simple. And the microRNAs become belong to the family of the small non-coding RNAs. And there are others. So we worked on the micro, but you, got, you also have the PI, the SN, the SNN, so SNO, sorry. So maybe that in the next years, we'll have papers and works on those RNAs. But we've been focusing on those microRNAs. So the, the story started in China. The very first publication came from Asia in 2013, so 11 years ago. And uh, those pioneers published an analysis of six microRNAs, which were different in endometriosis patients. So, you know, this was the real first step of the story. Of course, 11 years ago, those colleagues didn't have NGS, didn't have artificial intelligence. And this made a difference in our study. I'm going to show it to you. Then there was a very important paper in 2018 by Kavita Panier. Again, a few numbers of microRNAs were involved in endometriosis. And then a very important paper in 2020 in the American Journal. You see, this is only four years ago, and they were talking about six, eight, ten microRNAs. So what we did is a study, uh, and with those two technologies of NGS and artificial intelligence, we pulled out from the blood 2,600 microRNAs. Imagine the difference. It was six and eight or 10, and we pulled out 2,600 biomarkers with 86 biomarkers, which were different among endometriosis patients. So we said, okay, good news. It, it can be a diagnosis tool for endometriosis with a high score of sensitivity and specificity and an accuracy rate of more than 98%. So this was published, as I said, in 2022. We started in 2020 in Nature Scientific Reports. And uh, while working on this, in 2021, we read this paper in the Einstein Journal, which I don't read every day, I confess. And the idea was, in the conclusion, they were writing that it might be of interest to study the saliva. And of course, we, the gynecologists, are not used to work on saliva. We are very good for pap smear, for uterine sampling, for biopsies, for whatever, but no idea of saliva. So when we read this article, we thought, wow, we could launch a new study with saliva and see what's happening. We had absolutely no idea of what could happen. So this is what we did. And this, this study was published in 2022 in the Journal of Clinical Medicine. And the news were very good, even better. As you remember, the we had uh, 86 biomarkers different in the blood. And in the saliva, we found 109 biomarkers, microRNAs, which were different in the blood, in the saliva. So this was... Again, very, very interesting. It was 200 patients with a control group, of course. And of course, saliva is very simple, it's very reliable. And the good news is we perform study to study the stability of the saliva. And there's absolutely no change. You don't put the saliva in a fridge. You can send it by, by postal way, by, and, and uh, it doesn't change. If the analysis is performed one day after, one week, two weeks, three weeks, all the same. So it's very interesting in terms of expectations. We did conduct a medical uh, economic study, uh, which was published in the British Journal, showing that it's interesting for the society because you are avoiding laparoscopies. And then this was the first stone of the building, of course. We had to go further and we launched another study, bigger study at the beginning. We had three centers, five centers, and 18 centers in France, 14 months, and more than 1,000 studies. And um, we wanted to be sure that the results were as good as the, the preliminary studies. And we had a validation uh, study, interim data, the 200 first patients of this 1,000 patient study, 
uh, were anal analyzed by um, the New England Journal of Medicine evidence, and they confirm the validity of the test. This is very important because, as you know, the statistics are very important. And uh, this study was very, very interesting. We had more stage one, two than stage three and four. Clinical symptoms were non-discriminatory compared to the, the control group. And 100% of the patients are laparoscopy, which is, of course, very important to give uh, uh, an answer for those patients. So the, the answer, uh, the, the main conclusion of this study were that saliva uh, are very good, are very good biomarkers, better than blood, which was, and we had exactly the same results as in the first study. So sequencing reproductibility and the statistical validation uh, was confirmed by the New England evidence with a sensitivity of more than 95%, specificity more than 95%, and IUC more than 95%. So it became important and obvious that the results were better than what we had since now. So if you go back to this table, of course, it's better than surgery, better than MRI. So very interesting. And uh, we performed also another study for uh, fertility. In the first uh, series of patients, we, we pulled out the infertile patients. There were 24% of our series that were infertile. And among them were 34 microRNAs, which were different. Among the 100 and something, there were 34 different infertile patients. So it opens, uh, you know, a wide window of uh, consideration for infertile infertility and endometriosis. So now the indications. So yes, what I forgot to say is this 1,000 study has been, we have the results, they are exactly the same and exactly as good, and they are now under review and they should be published very soon. So, okay, th this is very interesting, but what do we do with this? And this is the, the title of this lecture, of course. So what the the... What we think today, it might change. Again, it has not been validated by Ashbury. It has not been validated by different societies. But what we think is that it could be interesting in, in those situations. So you have the patient, she has symptoms, uh, suggestive of endometriosis. You are not changing anything about your questionnaire, about your clinical examination, about your ultrasound and MRI. Okay, this is what we're doing every day. And then on the right side of the slide, you have a definitive endometriosis diagnosis because you have a deep infiltrating node, you have an endometrioma. So nothing is changing. You are referring the patient, you are treating her by either medical treatment, either RRT, either surgery. Nothing is changing. The interesting point is when you have nothing, and you know, those patients are very confused because they've seen many doctors. They are suffering, they have pain, they had uh, treat medical treatment and they're still suffering. And they say, okay, ma'am, but the MRI is normal, so you know, I cannot do anything. So for those patients, we think that it could be of interest to have the diagnosis by salivary test. If it's positive, then you can skip to the right side of the, the, of the slide. You know, you consider a treatment of endometriosis, you have the answer. So either you do a laparoscopy, then you have a medical treatment, whatever. And if it's negative, you can skip to other alternative uh, therapeutics like, uh, you know, alimentation, like psychotherapy, like anything you know. And uh, so it's um, very important for a patient to know, you know, it's very difficult to say, I don't know what I have. I'm suffering, but I don't know. So it's very important. So we are um, working with the HAS. Uh, we are also working for IFO in France with the HIS for reimbursement. You know, we are in a socialized medicine. Everything is free in France, so everything is reimbursed. And uh, they have been recognizing the, the value of the test, and they, they are launching a last study, which should be over at the end of this year. And the Minister of Health said that it will be reimbursed next year in 2025. As you might know, the politics is complicated in France today, so she will change, but we'll see. So to answer the question, shall we have, I'm sorry, uh, can I have the previous one? Sorry. Uh, to answer the question, uh, shall we decrease the number of laparoscopy for uh, under peritoneal endometriosis? Probably yes, if we use the test, because you have roughly, when you are performing a laparoscopy for 
a patient who has a normal MRI, normal, uh, who is still suffering after treatment, you have, let's say, 50% of patients where you find something and 50% where you don't find something. So it should be in this case that we avoid laparoscopy. Sorry. I, I did something wrong, I think. Yes, okay. And just to uh, conclude this lecture, um, can we go beyond endometriosis? It's like HIFO, you know, HIFO is good for fibroids, but it's good for many other things. And beyond endometriosis, yes, we can, because this is what I call the microRNA revolution. I'm sure that you will be touched by this revolution in the next month or years uh, in your practice. Why? Because, you know, the microRNA's functions are very important on metabolism, on invas invasion and migration, apoptosis, vasculogenesis, proliferation. So you immediately understand that it will be important for cancer, for neurology, autoimmune uh, diseases. And when you go through the, the PubMed, the literature, you see nearly every week a paper about, you see, gastric cancer, about uh, a pediatric multiple sclerosis, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, everything. So. It will, it's like genetics. When genetics arrived, it was everywhere, and I'm sure that microRNAs will be everywhere. You see a paper published last year, exactly what we're doing, salivary microRNAs as a non-invasive biomarker of hepatocellular carcinoma pilot study. So it's really interesting. And you see that in, in, in obstetrics, for example, uh, you have uh, papers now, um, potential biomarker, you see... Uh, First trimester of pregnancy, you see that uh, human germ placenta. So it's uh, it's uh, really interesting in many many fields, and I am sure that our practice will change. And the next step, what is the next step? Well, it might be the next step might be treating treatment of those microRNAs. So okay, you put this on the table. We showed that the microRNAs are different. Okay, good news. 109 for saliva for endometriosis patients, and maybe then we could treat them. And there are a few papers, not so many, but a few papers showing that it's possible, it could be possible, and especially with this CRISP uh, system. And uh, you see in very fundamental journals, they start working, the, the researchers start working on this, so maybe. We could say, okay, you have uh, such microRNA which is different. We're going to change it, and then the disease will disappear. Of course, it's science fiction, but maybe it's for tomorrow. We see another very recent paper treating a microRNA 34A and uh, with an anti-tumor efficacy. So I'm really sure that it's uh, it will be important in oncology. And we launched a study for ovarian cancer. All the gynecologists know how difficult it is to treat, to, 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 uh, to deal with those ovarian cancers. And we are waiting for the results, which should arrive at the end of this year. So, conclusions. i got two minutes left. So, I'm on time. So, this is the, the kit. It's very simple. You've got a box. You've got a, uh, something to put the saliva in. It's really easy. And you shake 10 times and the patient can send it by post if she's far away from a medical center. So the conclusion, very important, is it's a non-invasive diagnosis test for endometriosis, but it's not a screening test. So there's no idea of having a screening. Let's say I'm 20 years old. And my, my, my cousin who is 28 is suffering from endometriosis. I've got nothing, but I want to check. So no, no, this is not good. This is the nocebo effect, you know. Then this young lady, if she's positive, if she has nothing, will start to complain and have problems. So it's not a screening tool, it's a diagnostic test. And as you've seen, the interim results of the external validation confirm the relevance of the signature with an accuracy rate of 95%, as well as specificity and sensitivity. So it looks very interesting. Of course, we're still working on it. It's not finished at the end of the, we have to, to we, we, we are launching different studies with uh, different uh, kind of patients. Will the Asian or African patients have the same results? We had only Caucasian patients. So will the adolescent have the same results? And uh, we, we, shall we have the same result after treatment, for example? So it's very interesting. We had uh, several awards uh, in France and internationally, and we had the Gallian Prize in France in 2022, but 
We had the International Galleon Prize in June in Roma, very recently, so it's very good news. We had the reward from the Third Way Academy in France, Innovation Academy, and so on. So here we are. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much.